good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome uh, to this uh, panel discussion on the protection gap. Uh, my name is Rob said is Milan Simic, and I'm the Executive Vice President of AIR and Managing Director of International Operations. And it is my huge pleasure uh, this morning to introduce our panelists. And uh, first to the left of me is um, Dr. Erwin Michel Cajon. He's the Executive Director of the Wharton Risk Center not far from here at the University of Pennsylvania. Then next to him is Ian Brannigan. Ian is Chief Risk Officer of Renaissance Reholdings. And then left to him is uh, uh, Glenn Pomeroy, and Glenn has the honor of having arguably the, the best acronym title in the, in the world. He's the CEO of CEA, <coughs> Chief Executive Officer of the California Earthquake Authority. So really, it's, it's a great pleasure to sort of talk about the protection gap and really to get everybody on the same page and introduce the concept of uh, the protection gap. I wanted to show the, the slide and this number that you see on the, on the left-hand side, this, this circle, this pie of 74 billion is something that Bill already mentioned. It's an insurance average annual loss, something that we get when we run all our models on insured basis. And then on the right-hand side, you see a much bigger pie, a much bigger circle, uh, an economic uh, average annual loss of around 300 billion US dollars. And what that is, that is a combination of all the various losses that could happen in the world that come from obviously insured losses, that come from property that can be insured and that is not insured, and also all the losses that are seen by various individuals and governments uh, around the world. Uh, and then sort of to contrast that, I also wanted to show you the availability of reinsurance capital uh, in the world. And what you see here on the top of this slide are, uh, again, runs from our global suite of models. And when we run all the models that we have in CatTrader, you get av aggregate insured losses of the order of 300 billion at 250 year level and around 400 billion at 1,000 year level. So if you compare that with available capital currently in the market, which are the bottom numbers, and these numbers are provided by all the, the largest reinsurance broking houses in the world, you will see that the reinsurance capacity is currently large enough to cover the currently, and the emphasis here is on the word currently insured the world. So Clearly, if we are going to grow this business, as Bill said, we need to grow the pie. And one potential way of doing uh, that is to try to create uh, an economic loss curve. And what you see on this graph is the economic, a tentative economic loss EP curve. Aggregate values are in blue. Occurrence values are in green. And then just for the fun of it, we created a tentative uh, reinsurance layer that we sort of you know, called uh, that would be a layer that we would want to put in place to uh, ensure the whole world. And as you can see, that layer would attach uh, at about 1% of the world's GDP and exhaust at about 1.5% of GDP would convenient. And, and actually, the layer, you know, makes a, quite a lot of sense. It attaches at around 50-year return period or just short of 800 billion dollars and exhausts at around 250 year uh, loss or uh, just shy of 1.2 trillion dollars and sort of when we were putting these numbers I was quite pride because it was for the first time that we in the insurance industry were creating some losses that were on par with with our banking colleagues so so 1 trillion uh, made it sound sound quite big and, and quite impressive. Uh, and, and, and then the next thing, and you can see the ex attachment exhaustion probability in that, and then the next thing was, well, how much would it actually cost to insure the world? How, let, let's price this layer, and probably in this room we have the highest concentration of people who price cat treaties anywhere in the world today. So I'm, I'm going to sort of leave this slide for, for a few minutes and just ask everybody in the room, certainly those of you that price CAT treaties, to, to help us and, and try to see really how would you price this layer and what would be the, the cost of it. And sort of, you know, some of the tentative calculations we did are, are, are in the bottom right-hand corner and, and suggest a, a premium, an annual premium of around $8 billion. So in other words, in the size of the layer is, as you can see, about 400 billion. So if this 
you know, were, were to happen, I'm not saying it is possible, this would literally double the uh, uh, cat capacity that we currently have in the world. So it's definitely possible to grow the pie and, and ensure the world. So this is, this is just to set the scene. And so at this point, I'm going to leave this slide so, so that I can allow you to prize the cat, uh, the, the cat treaty. So I'm going to turn over to our panelists. And sort of when we talked about this, this panel, we said that really it is clear that the protection gap is available everywhere. And that was also clear in one of Bill's slides where we, he showed the differences between insured and the economic losses by by region, and so we know that the protection gap is, is everywhere. It's in the developed um, world, it's in the developing countries, and then you could, you could argue in a simplistic way that uh, really uh, you know, we are reasonably okay, or are we, maybe that's the question, are we okay on the supply side? We certainly have the means and the models to transfer some of the risk, so is, is it really that just the demand is the problem, and if it is, then what would be the ways of, um, of increasing that demand all around the world and what are the obstacles to increasing that demand? And maybe then as a, as a sub-question of that, are we better off trying to do something at the macro level? So in other words, trying to do it at the world level and getting all the world leaders to agree that they're part of the eight billion a premium and everybody chips in according to their GDP or something like that? Or are we better off doing it at the micro level uh, and, uh, you know, by region, by country? And then if, if you can mention the words California and micro in the same sentence, then I, I would particularly like maybe to hear some of Glenn's comments later on specifically to do with California, give, given uh, you know, where you come from and, and your expertise. But l let's start with, uh, with Urban, maybe sure. sort of Urban. Uh, over to you. Very simple question. You're talking about the future of your industry. <laughs> that's, that's what this is about. Well, first of all, thanks for having us here. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Philadelphia. We're based right here, so that's easy. But uh, Wharton and AR Worldwide have been, I think, working together for over 15 years now. So it's a long-term relationship, as we call it, on the personal <laughs> uh, matters. Uh, and our team has grown. Uh, we've been in business for 30 years now. And all we do is catastrophic risk, if you don't know us. Um, let me let me answer start answering the question, and Ian and Glenn will, will add to it. Uh, people, going back to Bill's comments about the, the what, what do you do at the party? Many people outside of the insurance industry don't realize that insurance has become the largest industry in the world. It's three times the size of the maybe four times now the size of the oil industry. I stop for on purpose here. Uh, because if you're a president of a country, I am start with the macro and then I, I go to the, uh, to the local level, but uh, it's impossible for you as a president or prime minister of a country not to have a very serious discussion with the insurance industry broadly defined uh, in terms of technology, in terms of who's going to bear some of these costs. We're talking about growing the pie, but you want to have the uh, capability of doing it. So at the macro level, we see through the OECD board that you and I are serving on, through so the work we've done with G20, through a lot of discussion I have personally with presidents and head of states, the question of risk financing, broadly defined, was a non-topic 15 years ago. You know, a president will tell you, yeah, you know, these things happen every 20 years, you know, we're going to pay for that. Uh, it's a very different game now uh, on the natural disaster front, on the cyber, on the pandemics. So like every three months you have another crisis. And uh, so I'll, I'll come back to that in your second question. But bo bottom line, the, the topic is becoming much more hot. That's a hot topic. So we're trying to make insurance sexy. Yeah, OK, it's supposed to be a French joke, but you, you get the thing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I believe it's sexy. In, in a, you, know, you create millions of jobs. So anyway, long story short, I think you need both. You need, at the macro level, you need the uh, elected official to recognize that as part of your regulatory system, you want to enhance that industry, whatever it takes. So instead of, of treating insurance companies as banks, and we know they're both financial institutions, but they're very different animals. Uh, well, you need to educate the regulators to do that. So it's true in the US, it's true in Europe, in Asia, that's, that's true everywhere. And, um, and to have that discussion, we started that discussion at G20 uh, under the uh, presidency of Mexico three years ago. We're carrying on this discussion at the G20. It takes five years for yeah elected official to realize that. So you need a macro level. At a, at, a, at a local level, I'll just take one example. We tend to think about the insurance gap as in developing low-income economies. 
We work with Mayor Bloomberg after Hurricane Katrina, after Hurricane Sandy, sorry, here in, in, in New York, New Jersey. And the numbers are pretty amazing. 80%, 80, 80 percent of people living in areas of New York and New Jersey that were flooded by Sandy had no flood insurance in a country that subsidized heavily flood insurance. 92%, I will stop there, of small businesses had no flood insurance. This is New York City. So the insurance gap is not just about going in you know, rural areas of Africa or Asia. It's happening right here as well in the largest market in the world. So I think just, just to, to realize, I think just taking the US, I mean, you have growing the US pie will be a big, a big deal. So let me stop here. Okay. Uh, I'll go back to your, the first question. I'll leave the macro and micro thing mm -hmm. for a moment. But I think if you think about what we're actually trying to talk about here, it's really sustainability and resiliency of populations and economies to the impact of natural hazards. And, and to the points already raised, that's both a developing and a developed world problem. Um, my experience over the last couple of years, in particular in the developing world space, working with um, many of the institutions that, that Owen just referenced, is that um, you've got to start with, if you go back to those of you that follow maybe UN developments around the world with regard to climate change uh, and other activities going on in the intergovernmental sector, the Sendai Agreement of last year um, in Japan is a really good example. So the Sendai Agreement was the UN coming out and trying to develop a framework for sustainability and resilience of populations and economies. And the number one thing that they talk about as the first action point, touches on some of what Bill said a, a short while ago, is about risk understanding. The whole subject of developing the awareness and ability to sustain the impact of natural hazards comes from the ability of both on the demand side and on the supply side, so demand for risk capital and supply side of risk capital, of being able to first of all understand what risk you face, whether it be insured, economic or otherwise. So that's the first place you have to start. It starts with risk understanding and that to me, for one, there are many other threads I could pull on to talk about this stuff, but actually what we have right now is a dramatic inefficiency in the system between us as the insurance, reinsurance and global sort of commercial modeling community into the likes of those government agencies in being able to match risk um, capital with demand. And the, but a big piece of that inefficiency comes from the inability for us to talk about and understand risk in the same way. If you look at the inefficiencies within the public sector, each of the big agencies that you might pick, the World Bank, the UN, the um, World Food Program, pick one, it doesn't really matter. There's an enormous duplication of effort across those organizations. They compete against each other, and they compete with us, too. And so my big focus, um, something that I've spent a lot of time in the last few years, is really on how can we reach a, a, a place of democratization of the understanding of natural hazards risk, which enables there to be a, a, a straightforward conversation starting on that risk understanding. The rest of it we can compete against between those public entities and the commercial sector and between us in the room. But if we could reach that point, that would be an enormous um, step up of the, of the ability of the world to bridge the gaps that we just talked about there from insured and economic losses. So the, the, the big focus for me is that risk understanding piece. Um, and that, to me, is the key to the whole subject matter. Can I? Yeah, sure. It's almost a two-step process where you need to understand the risk and that's what you guys are doing. That said, I'm going to play the devil advocates for a moment. We assume that by giving the EP curve to someone, he or she will make better decisions. And sadly enough, most of the time, it takes a little bit more than an EP curve to convince people to make decisions. <coughs> so we'll, we'll go back to the behavioral aspect in a minute. But uh, and you know, I'm, I'm trained in mathematics. I love EP curves, but people don't move through EP curves, you know, you need a little bit more, uh, you need to bring your MC uh, mm -hmm. to the discussion table here. So, I mean, the link between understanding risk and convincing people that it's actually in their best interest to move in one direction is, is a challenge, I So yeah. one thing back to that, come on, you go. And you have to start with understanding the problem they're trying to solve. Right. So this is, there's an economist called John Kay, who's a visiting professor at um, um, LEC at the minute, 
and he's, he wrote a book last year, and, and he talks about the tragedy of the horizon. And in my dealings with all of those groups over the last two years or so, the simple reality is most of those countries, let's just say, or local authorities in the developing world in particular, I think this is broadly true in the developed world also, actually they care much more about the one in three problem than they do the one in a hundred problem. And that's partly because of the, the agenda of their political office is five years and not a hundred years. And they don't have the money to pay for the one in a hundred problem. So understanding the problem that they're trying to solve and then bringing the solution to that is a first step. And us as an industry tend to focus on the one in a hundred problem and not the one in three problem. But, but then, then, then you had Erwin said that it takes approximately three years to make an awareness. And Absolutely. if you say, you know, there is a lifetime, is about five, then there's not much left between exactly. three and five. It's a glacially slow progress process. Unless you're re-elected. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. so, you're right. yeah. Sorry. But let's, let's turn to, to Glenn. Sure. <clears throat> well, good morning. Um, can I just say, first of all, uh, how delighted I am to be here. The, and to show you how dumb I am, when I, uh, about the time I took over as the head of the California Earthquake Authority, I also took up the sport of boxing. So, <laughs> I don't know if they're related or not, but a lot of people think I ought to have my head examined. But the, uh, of course, when I got here yesterday, I had to run the steps. I had to run the steps, two and it's a 5K uh, from here. I highly recommend it. It was uh, really fun. Uh, run to see the statue, run up the stairs. When I got to the top of the stairs yesterday, the sun was starting to go down. On top of the stairs was the Rocky impersonator with a hat. Go. <laughs> <clears throat> I was going to take his picture, but I thought he'd beat me up. So, I'd... the um, <clears throat> why don't we look at California as sort of a case study in terms of this protection gap? You know, think of California. Um, the, a, a micro the example, if you want. Thirty-nine million people. The uh, state's uh, country's most largest uh, uh, state. Home of two-thirds of the nation's earthquake risk. Uh, most Californians live within 30 miles of an active fault. The scientists say that another big one's coming. 99.9% .9 probability of a damaging, large damaging earthquake sometime in the next 30 years. They don't know exactly when. And most Californians, 90% of whom, uh, don't have earthquake insurance. So that's a gap, all right. Uh, why does it exist, and what are we doing about it? Well, primarily, it exists uh, because of the Northridge earthquake that occurred 22 years ago. California is still recovering from that massive earthquake in 1994. $40 billion worth of property damage. Uh, half of that was to homes, the residential, and half of the, resi half of the $20 billion worth of residential loss was insured. Insurance companies got their clocks cleaned and most resolved to get this risk off of their books forever. But there was this law in California uh, that required them to offer earthquake insurance if they're gonna be in the homeowner's market, and so that was a problem. And so most insurance companies quit writing homeowner's insurance because they didn't want to be forced to write uh, earthquake insurance. That's what led to the creation of the California Earthquake Authority. The CE was formed 20 years ago now to uh, not fix the protection gap, but to fix the broken California homeowners market and allow a vehicle to uh, allow homeowners insurance companies to stay in the state by offering an earthquake policy that they didn't have the risk for. Most of the industry, two thirds of the industry, uh, uh, took up that option and joined the CEA. They can now. Uh, market their homeowners policies and satisfy their earthquake risk by offering a CA policy. Uh, and, uh, and that's how it works. However, <clears throat> now, with um, 20 years worth of experience, uh, financial strength underneath us, now uh, over five billion in capital, uh, we have allowed us to transition to a point where we can start taking on that protection gap proactively. We're no longer just a backroom risk bearer. We have a mission of educate, mitigate, and insure. Educate Californians about the risk of earthquake insurance, uh, uh, help put in place programs to allow them to mitigate their own risk, uh, and then provide affordable and valuable uh, insurance uh, options uh, for those who, who wish to insure it. And the only way you can actually get real about dealing with a massive exposure problem, uh, protection gap like we have in California, the only way you can tackle it is to, is to, is to face into reality. There are a lot of reasons why uh, at least the majority of those 39 million Californians aren't protected financially for earthquake. There's a lot of reasons. It's not mandated, and in my opinion, won't be anytime soon. Uh, uh, and, and so in the voluntary setting, most people think, oh, the government will bail them out, or they might think it's covered in their homeowner's policy. Uh, uh, they're living in a state of denial, and they don't actually focus on the fact that they do live so close to this uh, very infrequent but potentially very severe risk. 
Um, and, and frankly, uh, a lot of people have told us in focus groups time and time again, they think the, the coverage for them costs too much for such an infrequent risk, and the coverage is too restrictive, the deductible is too high. So that's why the, the gap exists, lots of reasons. And what are we doing about it? Well, we're, we're, we're trying to face into those realities and tackle all the obstacles one at a time. There's no magic solution, but it's a matter of being resolved to tackle the obstacles as they're presented. So cost too much. Well, we've lowered our rates, combined about 50% while we've been in existence at a time when reconstruction costs have gone up 160% over the last 20 years. We've managed to lower our rates uh, over 50%, <clears throat> keeping basically the premium increase pressure uh, down to a minimum. We've beaten overall inflation because of our commitment to using best available science and lowering rates wherever possible. Lowering rates, expanding coverage. <clears throat> We were formed to offer this thing called this mini policy, which is a appropriately named uh, a piece of statute that describes the, the, the provisions that someone must be offered in order to check the box that they've been offered earthquake insurance. 5,000 bucks worth of personal property, 1,500 bucks worth of loss of use, no mitigation discount, a 15% deductible. We've blown all that up this year, 2016. We are now offering a, a, a much uh, more attractive set of policy offerings. Um, people can choose up to $200,000 worth of personal property, up to $100,000 of loss of use. Deductibles ranging all the way down from 5% up to 25%. It's a matter of giving Californians the choice so they can uh, choose to put the kind of policy together that meets their needs and budget. So cost, coverage, uh, mitigation, we're, design we're rolling out uh, programs to help Californians see how they can retrofit their homes and actually built in a 20% mitigation discount now for older homes into our policy. And then finally, uh, it's just a matter of uh, also communicating more effectively. I've got a little video here I'd like to show that just is sort of a summary of the way we have tried to take our messaging as we go into the future and actually have a more direct conversation with Californians. We, for too long, have, have, uh, have, have paid too much attention to the social science which I, I think caused us to read that too carefully and basically say, you can't scare people. Don't, don't scare people, they won't, you can't scare them into action, so fine, man, we've been so busy not scaring people that we haven't gotten anybody's attention. And we have produced lovely brochures with smiling families in front of lovely homes and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and the <laughs> take up rate uh, remains abysmal. <clears throat> so that's, uh, we're taking a different approach beginning this year with all those new coverage options, our, our, our lower rates, and a new method of uh, communicating, which is sort of is, um, symbolized in this 30-second uh, TV commercial, but this is the thread that runs throughout our, our communications. If you'd play the commercial, please. Most Californians live within 30 miles of an active fault, and most Californians don't have earthquake insurance. That's about to change. Announcing a seismic shift from the California Earthquake Authority earthquake insurance you can afford with more coverage choices deductible options and new affordable rates to fit your budget get the strength to rebuild learn more at earthquakeauthority.com so a little different approach <laughs> that's, that's noble <laughs> and um and uh who wants we'll, some <laughs> we'll see where it gets us um so it really it's just a matter of okay. facing into reality, tackling real problems, uh, moving on real solutions, and trying to make a difference. I agree with the opening remarks that this is a noble endeavor that we're all on to make our country and our world uh, a more sustainable place. And I, I enjoy being part of the CEA doing our part with respect to earthquake. Thank you. Thank you, Glenn. Particularly, I'm glad that we at least close a part of that gap by, by this initiative. So, so well done. Uh, so th thanks, everybody, for your initial comments. And I think what, what was common in what all three of you said is it is clear that um, this is not something that you know, us in this room or any uh, a number of other rooms can, can solve. It has to be really a concerted effort in the discussion between various governments, whether it's national, local, with public, private sector, also with academia as well. We shouldn't forget about the role of academia, this, the, the, the role that various public-private initiatives play and, and so on. But then, on the other hand, you can be a cynic and say, well, isn't it that too much and, and too many things and too many people trying to do too many things and flying to so many meetings and yet really hardly, hardly ever moving the dial on the, 
on the protection gap. So maybe if you can have maybe your, your comments, and I'm looking at the clock here, so maybe try to limit your comments maybe to a minute or two, and then we'll, we'll need to open for questions from the floor. Do you want me to start? Yeah. Sure. sure. Uh, this is an iPhone. If you work at Apple, you're obsessed about your clients all the time. I want to echo what you said. I think the industry has to think in terms of solution to the client rather than, oh, it would be great if people have insurance. It doesn't mean anything, you know. So what do you need? What do you, so if you're obsessed about the client, you, you, can, you, can, do, uh, you can do much more. Uh, can, you, can you show, I have a slide. Yeah, do, you, yeah. do you mind showing? I have one slide. It's very, uh, no, well, you can do it again. Uh, <laughs> We don't have in America a national accounting of disaster relief. That's pretty amazing. We don't know where the money is going. I mean, that's pretty amazing for the largest economy in the world. Uh, very briefly, I testified before Congress three years ago, and they asked me, uh, uh, we've done a big study, and the question was very simple. How much of the loss was paid by American <laughs> taxpayers versus insurance companies or the victims themselves? And I've just done that with the team at, at, uh, at Wharton for five hurricanes. And uh, it's very popular because it's very simple and it's color-coded. So that was Hurricane Diane back in 1955, about 3 4% was paid by American taxpayers. Hurricane Hugo, you mentioned that, Bill, in your, in your opening remarks, about 20 22%. Hurricane Katrina was about 50%. Uh, by the way, that's what Europe will typically do. I'll put the UK outside of Europe for a moment, if you don't mind, sir. Uh, that's the French, okay? So. Obviously, we cannot do worse than the French. Uh, well, kind of. Uh, that's Hurricane Ike and that's Hurricane Sandy. So, and I will stop here, but that's a picture of the US today, more or less. And the question is, is that sustainable? And the co no, of course it's not sustainable. So uh, the US, starting with the White House, we'll see who is the next president here, will be interesting, but uh, working with, I know you're going to talk about the the World Bank and others. I think you need solutions at the end of the day. You don't need just another conference to talk about these things. So that's why you know, the people in the room are the doers of the world. So if you can bring that together, that's, uh, that's fine. And, and there have been like amazing successes. Uh, so not just conferences. But, but, but well. Owen, very yeah. quickly, what's the key reason behind this trend? Two, well, a few things. One is uh, the word responsibility has disappeared of the discussion in America. You cannot have a discussion about your responsibility of you building your house in a floodplain or you building your factory next to the hurricane path. Uh, one, two, it's very hard for any elected officials. It's very hard for the president to go in front of TV after a big disaster, let's say a big earthquake in California, and to say, sorry, you got the commercial that Glenn put together, you didn't buy it, you're on your own. <laughs> it's very unpopular. You were in the room, you remember. Uh, and I, I cannot say otherwise. I, I've advised heads of states, and it's very, I mean, when you move from the academic world to advising a president or prime minister, I will say exactly the same thing. You need to bring a check, except that the check is getting higher and higher, the yeah. amount on the check, and it's very different, difficult for me as a president not to bring more than what my predecessor has brought in. So you get that curve going up and up. I mean, it's very hard, we're getting at the Hand here, 80%. Yeah. Uh, and you know, politics, when you get disaster, you get politics. And pretending it's not going to happen is just a you know, fairy tale story. The reality is yes, if there is a big earthquake in California, the first phone calls that Glenn is going to get is from the governor and from the White House. That's it. So let, 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 uh, do, you, do, you want to, do you want to talk about that phone call, sure. Glenn, or yeah. then we can. <laughs> no, we I don't want to talk about that phone call. <laughs> You think about that. <laughs> Play the situation. The, what, what's going to happen? The, um, I think uh, I was struck by something you said earlier. Is it is it a matter of uh, you keep going to meetings or do you work on solutions? And and I, I do think it's as as Erwan said, it's a matter of focusing on solutions. But I don't think it should be siloed. I, I think uh, for too long, actually, uh, being self-critical of my organization, I, I think uh, for too long after we were formed, we pretty much uh, were in Sacramento and we were trying to figure it out. Um, uh, 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 tapping into outside resources where we could, but I think we need to do more of that. And, and here's, here's an example. Uh, earthquakes, it, earthquake is an example, it's not mandatory, uh, and, and the banks don't require it, banks don't even talk about it. Well, there's a huge opportunity, I think, for doing more to partner up with the, the um, uh, home uh, lending uh, uh, industry 
and uh, working together to find new and innovative solutions to make it seamless and easy for someone when they're buying a home to put in place financial protection for it. That, that's an untapped, untapped opportunity now that we're just now beginning to try to figure out how to do. So it's a matter of uh, continuing to innovate, uh, uh, look at ways to maybe put in place policies that could last over time or maybe last uh, uh, you know, for a period of time tied to the mortgage or doing other things that haven't been thought of yet uh, because, because if we just keep doing what we're doing, uh, we're, we're not closing the gap. So, so it all sounds easy about, so we look at the, the, the people and the companies in the room and the capital that can be brought. The reality is most of the companies in this room have no idea how to talk to most of those organizations on the other side of the table, on the demand side. Most of the organizations on the demand side have no idea how to talk to us in That's the industry. Right. In addition to some of the competition between us elements that I brought before, and so there's a bunch of efforts going on right now to bridge those communication gaps. Insurance Development Forum, the Lloyd's Disasterous Finance Initiative, and a bunch of other things going on to do that. But being able to, to your question, Milan, bring together those disparate groups that have a reasonably aligned set of interests. They're not entirely aligned at all, but they're reasonably aligned. Um, to be able to begin communicating about how we might bring more capital to the demand problem and talk about that efficiency is, I think, 2015 leading up to actually to COP21 mm -hmm. is the first year where we actually have a shot at doing that into 2016. Um, so, I th so, if, 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 so watch the activities that are going on around us to bring together those conversations. And there are many going on, but actually, it's really hard to break down those barriers of talking. You talked about the time scale of working and developing. There's really only two or three reinsurance companies that have successfully been involved in originating transactions with the broader public sector. The rest of us simply don't have the resources to do it. So, actually, we as an industry have to join forces ourselves and align interests to bring meaningful capital to plug those gaps, in addition to smoothing out the inefficiencies from the demand side and being able to have easier conversations and a greater, um, I'll come back to it again, an easier ability to talk about the underlying risk in a way that takes the competition mm -hmm. and the lack of um, common understanding of it off the table. Can, can I have 10 seconds? Sure. Recognizing Renaissance leadership in, in the space, and indeed closing that gap is important. The, the other thing we, we really talk about the real power of that industry, insurance regions. You have the underwriting side, and that's what people think about. The real power to me is on the asset management side of the equation. The insurance industry by 2025 will have about 30, 32 trillion dollars of asset under management. What I've called the silent power, which makes the industry the second after pension funds. I.e., as an industry, if coordinated, you can talk to any president of any country in the world, saying, we actually invest $32 trillion somewhere. <laughs> uh, and if we can take some of that part and actually in a very articulated way, even 1% of it, you can invest in resiliency improving activities on the ground in location where you want to move the insurability frontier. It's a win-win situation. So, even communication between the underwriting side of the equation in the same company and the asset managers, really, you have a Chinese world in between, and we're trying to bring the gap. So we're having private discussions now with BlackRock, with big asset managers in the world, saying, can we invest in long-term uh, resilience-improving project? We're getting a consortium of very, very heavy names now. The challenge is how we convince the regulators that investing in the long term, i.e. more than two years, is actually good. Because yeah. uh, the regular is freaking out fighting the last war. I mean, that's always what's happening here. So that's what, you know, starting with the regulators, not as in, they're going to tell me what to do, but let's have that discussion about, yes, we can unleash some of that money for the good <laughs> of society and to increase the insurability of the world, but let us do that properly. And to enable us to communicate together as well. The way I think about it is, is that the, the, the trick to the gap is there's a spectrum of risk-aware development, mitigation of what's already there, and then post-disaster risk financing. Okay. 
you have to attack all of those three at the same time. And, and, and it's you're hard to stop us. Now, now, yeah. hard to stop you. And now you mentioned communication. I realize it's the time to open the, for the questions from the floor. So if I can, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure there will be questions, but if I can ask everybody to please introduce your name and affiliation and say whether the question is for uh, all of the panelists or, or one of them. So please. And if you have answers, that's even better. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. And there questions? is no bad question. There are only bad answers. So. Okay. The first one is the hardest. Someone has to stand no. up and. Who was okay. here in '92? And actually, this uh, this is Bill. Uh, this question is for you, Arla. Looking at the uh, which one is it? In um, gosh, I think Hurricane Katrina. There's a significant portion paid there. Is it true? I thought I've also read though that it, this implies that hey, the government's going to bail me out. But I thought that what I've read in statistics is that if you look at the average FEMA payment to an individual after Katrina, I think you guys may have looked at this about under 5,000 bucks. So I'm wondering, how do you reconcile those two things? That, that implies it goes to a person, but, but this, I don't think that's where this money is going. Is no. there anything you can say to that? How many of you are Americans? Okay. Good. <laughs> Excellent. You're paying for it. I'm paying for it too. Uh, Bri briefly, there is a big, big misconception of what federal disaster relief means in this country. Pe you know, Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Sandy happened, and the media reports billions of dollars, in $50 billion in the case of Hurricane Katrina. People, individual think, okay, that money goes to individual. No. At all, no. You get, if you qualified, and after eight months of hard administrative process, many of which we'll just re, you know, forget about, uh, that money goes to the states. So it's you paying for states reconstruction, public infrastructure reconstruction. And I think that discussion hasn't happened in America. We're trying, you know, testifying before Congress, having that discussion with Senate and the House and OMB saying, at least let's decompose that 50 billion so people, the American people, understand where that money is going. Uh, if you're not American, we have the Stafford Act. It's called the Stafford Act in America. That guarantees, by legislation, guarantees that at least 75% of the losses to that state affected by a disaster will be paid by American taxpayers. At least 75%. You know, we learned from the financial crisis the word moral hazard. You know, we've been teaching that for 20 years, but people are learning now. But if you're the governor of the states, what What's your incentive to actually invest in risk reduction measures if you know that you're guaranteed by law that at least 75% of your losses, and again, in the public sector, would be yeah. paid by Washington? So we're trying to propose alternative now, working with a few committees on the Senate side, OMB and others, FEMA, say, well, maybe we can do better. Uh, but to your point, uh, many people get just you know, a few couple of thousand dollars a year later. So my, my pitch has been that I, ha I don't have any stocks in any insurance companies to stay neutral. Uh, you, you better have insurance. I mean, that's, there is no comparison. We've done some comparison. I mean, it's much quicker. You know what you're getting. The insolvency issue has been more or less addressed. I mean, we're, we're pretty solid here. So. Let, let's bring Glenn quickly. This. I know the slide shows hurricanes, but I'm, I'm sure it applies to earthquakes very, as well. Very briefly, government assistance is limited, even though the, the totals wrap up into very significant dollars when infrastructure damages and so forth are paid for. There's very little in terms of uh, taking care of an individual family. FEMA has a grant maxed at $32,000, and the average is about $5,000. You're right. There's, there's low interest loans. Uh, if you qualify, uh, uh, to, um, it has to be repaid, stacked on top of your mortgage. So in, in fact, the, the, um, um, the factual data like this does help contribute to sort of the general misunderstanding that I don't need to take personal responsibility because the government will bail me out. So it, it, it is a matter of uh, ongoing communication and education. In terms of economic recovery and, and, the, and infrastructure, it's very clear data that the, if, if um, post-loss financing is pre-funded, the multiplier of the reduction in the cost of reconstruction is about six times, as opposed to it being a mm -hmm. charitable donation after the event happens. Yeah. Yeah. Six times. Okay. Thank you. Or maybe just one check if there are any uh, questions. Yeah, yeah, there is a question.
Bhaskar, um, modeling. So what you talked about is post-event mitigation, kind of risk uh, mitigation. What about pre-event mitigation? We haven't heard anything about it. Uh, so before the event happens, what kind of mitigation can we do about building quality or anything? And should any authority invest in it? And if so, in what domain? Like, you can guard a house against a 80 mile hour wind or you know, seven versus an extreme event. What kind of mitigation expenses should be incurred in there? That question for all? Okay, well, let's have everybody maybe fill in. Just half a minute each, please. Uh, very briefly, the mitigation activity we're doing is all pre-event. It's a, you can actually, for earthquakes, make homes safer through stronger building codes, which California, for the most part, has. So our mitigation efforts are focused on the older building stock, uh, which need bracing and bolting and shoring up. And you can actually substantially reduce the risk of that older home toppling off the foundation. So uh, uh, mitigation is terribly important to actually help people proactively uh, uh, manage their, their risk, life, and safety. Uh, there's still going to be a need for financial protection, so it's a matter of combining the two, mitigation and insurance. Yeah. Now, so risk-aware development and mitigation are the two first phases on that spectrum I mentioned a minute ago. A really good example, so the UK right now, the floods in the UK, so the UK government last year blamed that on climate change. That's not climate change, it's land use change. That's the biggest driver of sure. increased flood risk in the UK is land use change, not climate change. So that is poor risk-aware development by local authorities within the developed world. And that's exactly what you get okay. all over the place. I want too quick, no, I think that's, that's critical. I think that's where we're going as an industry. For like 15, 20 years, many people were working on that, but again, the asset management side of the insurance industry was doing the work, so your loss ratio could be okay. Uh, now you don't get the same return on the asset management portfolio, i.e. you need to turn to the engineers and actually ask them to help you mitigate. So that, that's really happening. There is a big shift in the insurance industry from, uh, yes, that's important to actually doing it. The challenge though is how do you link that mitigation effort, the pre-disaster even to your premium? People want to see a reward on their yeah. premium and sometimes you don't, you, don't, you don't get that. So that's one and two. Next question is who's going to pay for that? That's not, that's not obvious. We did a study for Bloomberg in New York uh, that was published in Science Magazine. It takes $20 billion to protect New York City against flood. That's the number. Uh, good. Now we have a number. Okay, where's the 20 billion dollar? And so that's true at the individual level, but you know, I, I don't know whether you want to talk more about that. The, you know, the, yes, we know, I think the engineering side, the science is great. We know exactly what to do, and more or less. The question, how do we do it? Uh, there are affordability issues, there are practicality. Yep. If I have a house in California, I want to <coughs> retrofit it. Where do I live for six months? I mean, that's not something you do overnight. So uh, the inconvenience aspect is, is important, but yeah, that's, that's obviously the, uh, the solution. Okay, right, with that, uh, uh, I think our time is up. Oh. One more quick. Okay, sure, sure. Well, so, sorry, early. Paul Bianco uh, with Travelers. Just a quick question you mentioned about needing to be responsible where to build. You know, certainly since the 1950s, there's been an increase of uh, homes along the coast. Over time, those homes have gotten larger, so the amount of money that would need to be paid by the government would increase proportionally. Can you talk about um, the economic impact or any studies that you might be aware of relative to the impact of, of building codes? And you know, if you did have increased resiliency, stronger building codes and building to those above model standards, what type of you know, trade-off you would get on an economic level uh, for that mitigation? I'd start with, uh, there's a reason why they're called barrier islands. <laughs> that would be the place I'd start. Mm -hmm. And then I'd also go to actually the unintended consequences of poor regulation and government pooling to some extent, where so that you know the, it is simply a fact that um, the flood insurance program in the U.S. encouraged people to build places where they shouldn't be, is one aspect of it, as opposed to actual mitigation of the building stock itself. So I think it's, I'd start there. There's a all over the world pla properties in places that they shouldn't shouldn't be, frankly. Then on the mitigation side, I mean, we we, we patented some technology which. Um, Cost about two thousand dollars to retrofit a standard hip roof, uh, residential roof, which would reduce um, um, suction on the on the on the roof edges by two hurricane categories. Um, and to your point, Owen, earlier on, we were unable to get insurance companies to sell that, partly because the, the homeowners wouldn't pay for it. 
So the cycle involved there is really tricky. But actually the mitigation stuff really can work um, and, and make significant differences on both earthquake and the hurricane wind damage side of things. Okay. It's my sense that humans in general tend to react to things that have happened rather than sort of see over the horizon and, and, and be proactive. The, in California, we've had a number of big earthquakes, and that, those have each been learning opportunities in, which, in the aftermath of which each time building codes have been enhanced and strengthened. Uh, so be, because of the fact we've had a bunch of earthquakes, you know, we've got pretty good building codes. And the trick is to try to figure out a way to be proactive and put in place those measures that will help and don't wait for a massive disaster to, to, to make you then wake up and do it. Uh, I'll send that to you, but we, we did a study with travelers, not because you, you asked, but uh, Jeff Fishman and then Alan, Alan and you see has been very supportive. Uh, there is no national building codes in America, which is interesting. Uh, so you have to state by state, which obviously makes your job much more complicated. But I'll send you the state. I mean, bottom line, we confirm what we expected, i.e. that if you had much more stringent and enforced building codes, uh, the country would be much better, but that has to be required and enforced. And we have a challenge in this country about anything that is required. Uh, but at some point, you know, the government has to say, well, I'm sorry, but tornadoes cost too much money. We have to enforce that regulation. Uh, the, contrary the other example, then I stopped time out for 15 minutes already, You're waiting for your coffee. Uh, a group of us were advisors to the prison of Chile after the Mole earthquake. And Chile, to your point, Glenn, had a series of massive earthquakes. The earthquake in Chile was 500 times stronger than the one in 80 that hit three weeks earlier in 2010. 300,000 people died in 80, 400 people died in Chile. The main driver was building codes. Uh, it's, a, it's a miracle that only 400 people died given the 8.9 earthquake in, in Chile. Uh, we have to learn from these international experiences as well. Excellent. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Uh, with that, our time is up, and I'm going to have to close the panel. So our panelists will be here at least uh, during the break. So I would encourage you, if you have any questions, please come and, and speak to them. Uh, and uh, with that, another very big thank you to all three of you. It was an excellent discussion, and I thank you for it. And please thank the panelists in the usual way. Thank you. Thank you.